Well, I took the announcement that uh, our class is going to be starting 15 minutes earlier, and uh, I got a lot of family coming over, so I will be cutting out of here at 12.15. You're welcome to stay, but I'm out of here because i got to go help my wife get ready for our guests. So, <coughs> happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. You know, I went for a jog this morning in our neighborhood, and I got to find out who the believers are just by saying he is risen and seeing who responds. And uh, it was the family walking four dogs that responded. So, yeah. So, and I asked them where they, they said, you guys have got four dogs? And they said, none of them are ours. <laughs> they said, our children have all left the nest and they left the dogs with us. <laughs> so they went from zero dogs to four dogs. So. Fortunately, the dogs like one another, so that's good. So, uh, well, I mean, I would say Happy Easter. He is risen, and sometimes they would not say anything at all. Sometimes they would say, "Well, Happy Easter to you," but yeah, the one with the four dogs says he is risen indeed. So, amen to that. That's good. You know, Easter is a special time. Uh, I don't know of any other time where it's easier to present the gospel than at Easter. I know a lot of you, like me, are going to be spending time with friends and family. So I thought I'd give a little exercise this morning. And uh, actually, if you were following my Facebook page about a week ago, I put up a post and it had a phenomenal response, which is basically just telling my story of how I'm frequently on a university campus and we've got atheist science professors there who respond to the model, the creation model that we present. And every time we've done that, except for one, there's only one time it didn't happen, uh, but the atheist science professors will say, Dr. Ross, can you name one or two scientific discoveries that would cause you to abandon your Christian faith? And I say, sure. Uh, if you can show me uh, beyond any reasonable shadow of a doubt that the universe didn't have a beginning, that would be catastrophic to my Christian faith. And if you can show me that the origin of life has a strictly naturalistic explanation, that would at least be corrosive to my Christian faith, if not catastrophic. Another one that would be catastrophic, if you can prove to me scientifically that we humans are no different than the animals, that would be catastrophic to my Christian faith. And I said, if you can show me that all the evidence for fine-tuning that I've given you in this past half hour, uh, that all of that goes away uh, through more scientific uh, investigation, that would be corrosive to my Christian faith, if not catastrophic. But I said, here's the big one. If you could prove to me scientifically or historically that Jesus did not rise bodily from the dead, that would be the ultimate. Do that, and it's over. Now, whenever that happens, I take the opportunity after disclosing, these are things that would be catastrophic to my Christian worldview. And I would say, sir, can you name some scientific discoveries that would cause you to abandon your atheistic worldview and receive Jesus Christ as creator, Lord, and Savior? And every time I've done that, I'm met with silence. <laughs> I says, well, surely you can name one. And the reason why I give you the ones I just did, the reverse works. Okay, if I can show you, sir, that beyond any reasonable shadow of doubt, the universe really did have a beginning, doesn't that imply that your atheistic worldview is incorrect? There's got to be a creator to explain the existence of the universe. Or if I'm able to show you scientifically that we humans are distinct from the animals, that we have exceptional qualities that are not shared by any other animals in the face of the earth, wouldn't that destroy your physicalist worldview. Or if I could show you that consciousness has no naturalistic explanation, or the origin of life, I said, wouldn't that be catastrophic? Or if I can show you that Jesus really did rise bodily from the dead. Now, sometimes I've done that, they'll say, well, you know, if you can actually pin that one down for me, that would make a difference. And that's exactly what it tells us in 1 Corinthians 15. Let me read you the text. It says, if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, 
our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he was raised, uh, that he, in fact, uh, was dead. Uh, pardon me. But if he did not raise him, sorry, I, I'm getting this wrong. Um, let me go back. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. And if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then those who have, have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we're to be pitied among all men. And sometimes I read that uh, when I'm in a university setting saying, notice the Bible puts that test out there. If there is no solid evidence for the resurrection, our Christian faith is useless. That frequently comes as a shock to people. And sometimes I'll use this with my friends at Easter, just read them this text. And they're stunned to discover the Bible itself is saying, evidence counts. If the evidence is not there, our faith is useless. Look at the evidence and see. Okay, now, if you flip the page back to the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15, it gives you some evidence that Jesus indeed has been raised bodily from the dead. Don't turn there. Uh, but notice that Paul actually gave the evidence first, then he raises the issue. Okay. This being Easter, you've got friends who are not yet followers of Jesus Christ. How can you share with them? And Ross, I heard you mention Gary Habermas uh, in the class uh, just before this with joint heirs. I've known Gary for, gee, 15, 20 years. He's actually coming out with a 3,000 page book. Actually, it's going to be 10 books, 300 pages each. But 3,000 pages on the evidence for the bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead. He says, I've written a book before that was 300 pages, but I didn't cover all the evidence. So now a publisher has given me an opportunity to actually publish all the evidence for the bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead, all 3,000 pages worth. So that tells you there must be a strong case for the bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead. But I'm going to turn the tables on you. You meet someone three hours from now, and they ask you, okay, what is this evidence that Jesus rose bodily from the dead? Is it incontrovertible? Uh, could I actually make a case that he didn't rise bodily from the dead? What would you say? Okay. Any hands? All right. There were 500 people, several men and several women that witnessed and saw him after his resurrection. You read the first part of 1 Corinthians 15. <laughs> That's exactly what Paul says before he gives this passage starting in verse 20. He says, there were 500 eyewitnesses to the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And then since some of those 500 eyewitnesses are here. So you actually go talk to them. Now, you're a skeptic. You say, well, 500 eyewitnesses. When was this book written? You know, 1900 years ago? How do I know this is credible? What's your response? Because <coughs> eyewitness testimony is considered to be strong under certain conditions. Okay? And see the point that he's making? 19 centuries indeed have gone by. I don't know any of those 500 eyewitnesses, mm -hmm. but notice the testimony of those eyewitnesses has not been refuted over 1900 years. Mm -hmm. No scholars come forward to refute any of that testimony. And Paul wrote this at a time when people could actually meet the eyewitnesses. Mm -hmm. He didn't put it into writing 200 years later. He put it into writing at the time that those eyewitnesses were there. Yes? What I've always fallen back on is indirectly about their behavior as well, like you just recently right. mentioned. I mean, you know, human nature hasn't changed in 1900 years, and these people were persecuted, many of them. And, you know, if you understand the culture of the time to be thrown out of the synagogue 
wasn't like we can understand. I mean, at that point, you lost all, all economic commerce, you lost all relationship. I mean, you basically were you know, put in a, in a dungeon of sorts. And so these people did all this after this experience, which to me has always been very indirect evidence. Yeah, it's not just that they died for their faith in spite of uh, you know, great persecution, you're right. They got kicked out of the synagogue. Somewhat similar to say if you're a practicing Mormon and you get excommunicated, uh, they take your spouse away, they take your children away, they take your job away, all your friends are cut off, you literally lose everything. It was like that in the first century for a Jew that got kicked out of the synagogue. No one else would have contact with them. Well, Their livelihood was gone. Right. I mean, people died. Yeah. So getting kicked out was a big thing. And they said, fine. I know my Lord is risen. Okay. This side of the class. Yes. Yeah. Is it, is it, does it also depend upon uh, uh, how, much you, how much you can trust the actual scriptures at this point? And, uh, and, and so in that regard, you know, I mean, it, I can't say specifically, but New Testament is probably as, uh, as uh, uh, copied and so many copies <coughs> have been made back through time that's more than any other book available. So, so, so it becomes, a, you, you have, so if they raise the question, well, how can you trust the scriptures? I mean, you, have th you then have to have that evidence that, hey, this, this scripture is, is um, the most reliable book that we have. Most documented book. Most, most documented book. Yeah. <clears throat> um, how many of you have ever been exposed to the Punic Wars? How many of you know what the Punic Wars are? Okay. All right. You know, that's, you know, Hannibal and uh, the Romans uh, fighting the Punic Wars. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we got five manuscripts of the Punic Wars. The earliest manuscript we have is 9th century AD. And yet we consider the testimony of those manuscripts to be reliable because we got five manuscripts and the five manuscripts remarkably agree. Okay, anybody know what kind of testimony evidence we have for the New Testament? How many manuscripts do we have and how we early do they date? Yeah, well, 30 years ago, the story was that we had 16,000 manuscripts of the New Testament that go back to the third and fourth uh, century AD. That number is now doubled. Uh, so that's so many new manuscripts that they have found. That would include <coughs> the fragments? That does not include the fragments. Oh. Okay, the earliest fragments go back to about uh, 56 to 60 AD. They're small. Uh, with John, we've got some uh, that are like a whole page that go back to the 90s AD. And so, Again, Punic Wars are considered reliable, even though you got, what, uh, you know, 12, 13 centuries between the earliest manuscripts and the event, you only got five manuscripts. In the case of the New Testament, we got tens of thousands uh, going back to the third, fourth, and fifth century AD, with fragments going back to the time of the actual eyewitnesses. And uh, yeah, remarkable agreement. Uh, you know, one scholar I know that studied this says, when you compare all these manuscripts, there are 40 words that are in dispute uh, in terms of the differences amongst the manuscripts. And none of those 40 words impact a single doctrine of the New Testament. Yeah? Peter Carson Keeley published a book about 20 years ago. He pushes a fragment of Matthew <coughs> possibly to 50 AD. Yeah. His argument holds water, I don't know, but he's going to do an excellent yeah, there are three manuscripts of Matthew that are in the 50s, between 50 and 60. And uh, yeah, I mean, the problem with uh, carbon-14 dating is that to get a really accurate date, you got to consume a significant part of the sample. And when you only got a fragment this big, uh, it's hard to get a really but precise his date. argument was from a linguistic standpoint. In other words, he was comparing arguments of the scriptorium. This is the style of language they use that was only in, in, in existence at right. a certain time. Right. Yep. Which essentially is when they were written, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, so it was actually written at the time of the eyewitnesses. And the eye, I mean, if what was recorded in Matthew was false, or Mark was false, or John was false, people would have said, hey, that's not right. I mean, that happens. And do we see anything 
I mean, that's the other uh, big testimony, is you actually had historians who were Romans and Jews who were uh, against the Christian faith, and basically they were not able to refute the claims in the New Testament. Yeah. None. No counter to it. Now, there are people saying it didn't happen. I mean, you've got Josephus saying, there are people who say that this man rose bodily from the dead. He's not endorsing it, but there's nothing in his writing that refutes anything. And, and likewise with Tacitus, the Roman historian. People are saying it happened. He's, saying it, he's not saying it, it did or it didn't, but he's saying people are saying that it happened. Right. Wow. Yeah. Okay, here, and then I'm going to go back to here and over to here. Yeah. Well, this is great. I'm glad you guys are jumping in on this. Lago <laughs> made the point, point in class. It's really important that among the followers of Jesus, there was nobody who said this didn't happen. Right. No, it didn't happen this way. This is fake news. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you know if was there anything in the apocryphal writings that, that were not included that did say that? Have you ever heard that? No. No. There are. No. no. That's kind of the strength of the apocryphal writings is that they don't criticize what is orthodox. Right. Yeah. Okay. We're talking about this uh, chain of evidence and critiquing uh, in Acts chapter 4, where it's told that the Sadducees came to the temple guards complaining that John and Peter were preaching the resurrected Christ. And in verse 3, we're told that 5,000 people were uh, <coughs> total uh, <coughs> of followers of Christ. Well, that was probably a chance for somebody to critique among 5,000. And for several years afterwards, among 5,000, there would have been young ones uh, that would have critiqued uh, manuscripts. So that's a good start to the chain of evidence. Mm -hmm. Very good start. They estimate that the population in Jerusalem at that time was 30 to 35,000 people, and that within a half year, 15,000 of them became followers of Jesus Christ. Wow. So to get those kinds of numbers that quickly, that gives credence to the empty tomb. Basically, the disciples could say, hey, if you don't believe us, go check out the tomb. So they could go over there and uh, check it out, and they could hear the stories. You know, I learned something this week when I was on the Mount, but uh, when I was studying for my talk this morning, if I could share it. Yeah. Um, First Corinthians was written about 20, we believe, 21 to 22 years after Jesus, Jesus' life. Now, in, in First Corinthians 15, earlier in that chapter, Paul repeats a creed that it was obviously a creed, uh, um, a verbal creed of the early church. Let me just read through sure. it. Sure. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 5. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, and indeed had heard it before, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, Peter, then to the twelve. And Gary Habermas says that even among critical scholars, scholars who are not believers, they believe that that creed was circulating among believers. Some of them believe one to two years. Others believe within months or even weeks after Jesus was, was resurrected. No, it's correct. I actually got to hear Gary give a, a lecture just on that one point. And what he did is he took us through the New Testament and showed us all the creedal statements. It's not just in Paul's writings. You see it in John's writings <coughs> as well. And he says, if you look at all these creeds and realize that most people at that time uh, were not literate, and so what was happening is that the disciples were actually giving them these verbal creeds that they could easily memorize. And yet the fact that there's so many of these short creedal statements that you see in the New Testament indicates that this had to go back very early, as he argues, probably within less than six months of the actual resurrection of Jesus from the dead, you've got these creedal statements in place. And so he actually says that's even stronger than the carbon-14 evidence on how early some of these manuscripts are. What was this book in the shelf, do you know? When will this book, well, he's going to bring them out the volumes kind of one at a time. What and uh, Gary, Gary Habermas, he, he's the world's leading expert on the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. 
He frequently debates, uh, the last name is H-A-B-E-R-M-A-S. Uh, you can Google him. Uh, but yeah, and if you want, you can go on YouTube and watch several of his debates he's had with atheist Bible scholars. They don't fare well. Uh, well, they basically concede his points. Yeah. So even though they don't, quote, believe in the resurrection, uh, he says, you know, it's people who are not historians who will try to deny uh, the resurrection. But he says, even the non-believers who are historians basically say, i got to grant you that. And so you can actually watch the debates. It's quite revealing. We have to thank the Jesus Seminar for this wonderful thing they did because it brought forth Jason Marlin, Habermas, and all these other guys who responded to their arguments, which were weak, with things like this. Well, what's interesting, just talking to Gary, he says it's the best of the non-believing historical scholars that have actually agreed to do public debates. And, uh, you know, there, there are people with doctorates who've written on this, and he says they concede the points. So even though they're not believers. In the back. How would, a, how would people of the first century have written and published and preserved contrary accounts? So, for example... Today, if, there are, if somebody said, well, th this guy rose from the dead, you, know, you have the internet, you have rapidly produced publications, etc. So there would be very quick counter evidence, or at least contrary claims. So what we say that we have these documents that, that proclaim the truth and that there's no contrary, no, no contrary evidence of it. But how would they have created this contrary evidence, and would they have wanted to? Well, so that would be one of the things I would be interested in knowing, because a good atheist would argue, look, you have some, you know, your, your, your claims are interesting, and you're on their face they make sense. But if I were back then and I wanted to dispute that, I wouldn't write any documents because I wouldn't need to. So there wouldn't be any existence of well, this is the whole point. The strategy of the leaders, the scholars who are not believers in Jesus Christ, was basically ignore it. They made no attempt to refute it. The only refutation you see of the bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead that dates back to that era is the one you find in the Bible. The Bible records the only refutation that came out at that time. So you see nothing in the writings of the Romans uh, or the, uh, the Jewish uh, hierarchy uh, publishing the refutation. The only account we got is actually in Scripture. And you all know what that is? What is the refutation that we see recorded in Scripture? The, yeah, that the disciples stole the body. That was the only attempted refutation of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead that is in print that we have to this day. Everything else, there's, yeah. very similar to saying there was a sighting of a unicorn. You know, well, it never happened, so why would I publish it? You know, some people out here said, well, there's some unicorn I saw a couple of days ago, and people think, well, it's no big deal. And well, a whole bunch of people thought, I hate that unicorn. well, unicorns just don't happen. <laughs> so how would, Maybe like well, Josephus why would people do it? Well, why would even Josephus do it if it never happened? Well, someone produced well, the body. Let me give you an analogy I think works. Okay, lots of people claim to have seen UFOs. In fact, so many tens of millions of people that people have actually written books refuting a lot of their claims. If we're talking a unicorn, how many people actually claim to see unicorns that, have, are, that are sober, okay? <laughs> uh, there are very few, so you know, why bother writing a refutation about unicorns? Even the guy who got drunk and saw them doesn't believe it. But the problem is, You've got this huge population of people who seriously do think that Jesus rose bodily from the dead. So again, using the analogy of UFOs today, if you've got a lot of serious people claiming this, that yeah, it's going to motivate scholars to write a refutation. But if you haven't got a case, your best strategy is to ignore it. And so this is evidence that the Romans didn't have a case, the Jewish leaders didn't have a case. Uh, all that came out was what we see in Scripture. Oh, uh, they... Uh, Jewish leaders spread the story that the disciples stole the body. Now, the fact that it stopped right there tells you that's not a very credible claim. Okay, 
Why is that not a credible claim? Well, I mean, I, maybe what you're getting at is what the consequences would have been for the Roman soldiers, the reality of Roman, of, of again, the military presence at that time. You know, if, um, if it was an order that this, this site be uh, protected, you know, they, they had their lives to lose. They were professional soldiers, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just not plausible that the, the disciples could have stolen the body even if they had attempted it. Yeah, and this is actually a point that's conceded by leading non-theistic scholars, is that this idea that the disciples stole a body has no credibility. And some of the reason, by the way, this isn't coming from Christian scholars, it's coming from non-Christian scholars. They make the point that the text makes it clear that uh, when Jesus was arrested and when he was crucified, uh, what happened? The Jewish leaders went to Pilate and said, we want the tomb guarded. We want to protect it with a Roman seal, which means it's put in this tomb, a two-ton boulder was rolled across it, there was a Roman seal, and they said, we want a cohort of Roman soldiers to protect the seal. And uh, that has legal consequences. Incidentally, a cohort numbers anywhere from 16 to 200 Roman soldiers. And a guard cohort is trained for two years to protect nine square yards around the soldier against all odds. Uh, so that's the kind of guards that happen. And what non-Christian uh, scholars point out, it's simply not credible that 11 men without military training, without military equipment, could overcome a cohort of Roman soldiers. And you're right, if you're a guard soldier, the penalty for allowing the Roman seal to be broken or is- like the falling asleep thing too. Yeah, the same thing, if you fall asleep or allow the seal to be broken, uh, the penalty is that you'll be crucified upside down. Did McDowell? Well, he did, but he wasn't the first. I mean, you can actually go back, uh, you know, a couple of centuries and see this. In fact, probably one of the more famous stories, this goes back to the mid-19th century. It was uh, three British lawyers decided to put on trial the case for the bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead, and they wound up writing a book on it. These were not believers. And basically said, after studying this for a couple of years, we've come to the conclusion that the historical evidence for the bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead is stronger than the historical evidence for the defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo. Now keep in mind this was written in the mid-19th century, which means you got soldiers that were at Waterloo that were alive, lots of them, at the time that these three uh, British lawyers have put this into print. And incidentally, uh, this is what brought all three of them to faith in Jesus Christ. So they start off as skeptics, with the goal to prove that the resurrection didn't happen and wound up concluding the historical evidence is actually stronger Do than the defeat. Do you remember one of those lawyers' names? Uh, his, uh, um, it's letter. cited by several scholars. I don't know it off the okay. top of my head, but yeah, you can look it up. And uh, yeah, it's, it's still available. So, um, and you, you can ask skeptics. How many of you think that Napoleon was not defeated at Waterloo? I mean, today in the 21st century, it's long gone happened. But yeah, I don't think you're going to find a rational person saying it didn't happen. Yes? It's hard, it's hard to picture a guy like Peter who that night was accused by a girl about 15 of being a Galilean who ran off scared to death from her. But two days later, he was going to take on a Roman garrison and steal the body. Yeah. And so those, those type of things are in those records all through it. Yeah. Well, the point is no scholar, Christian or non-Christian, is given credibility to the idea uh, that uh, the disciples stole the body and notice that the Jewish leaders dropped it. I mean, that's the first story they came up with, but they, they didn't push it. And one other thing is the silence of the Talmud for people who have a vested interest in the subject is deafening. So, well, also note this. You'll see this in the book of John, uh, the Gospel of John. You know, the women, they're the first ones to see the resurrected uh, Christ. And then you got Peter and John coming to the empty tomb, and it says they saw the grave clothes. So now if you actually read carefully what you see in the Gospels, uh, Jesus was given a rich man's burial. And it said that he was clothed in linen, so he had a burial cloth of linen, and pressed into that linen 
was a talent's worth of rosin. Okay, minimum weight of a talent is 75 pounds. Okay, and this rosin would set in the linen kind of like fiberglass. Any of you ever worked with fiberglass? That's how you make fiberglass. You basically take linen or some kind of uh, artificial material that's like linen and you keep pressing in uh, this rosin and what do you get? You get a fiberglass material. Okay, if you're talking 75 pounds worth, that means you've got about a three inch hard coating all around the body of Jesus up to the neck point and then there'd be a head cloth put in. Basically what the disciples saw, because what does the text say? They walked into the tomb, they saw the grave clothes, and immediately they believed in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Basically what they were seeing was an empty bottle and a collapsed headpiece. And the bottle wasn't broken, no cut or slit. Okay, would that convince you that he rose bodily from the dead? If you saw the equivalent of a fiberglass body piece right up to the neck with a small uh, enclosure, and a headpiece, and uh, nothing is uh, broken. Yeah, they immediately believed. So if One look. So if you're stealing a body, it's grab and go and get out of there before the Roman show up, and then do all that someplace else. Well, if you're going to steal a body, you better have a saw to cut through all that right. fiberglass and split it open and get the body out. Yeah, but a burger grabs and goes. Uh, get but out of there fast. Notice what the text says. One glance, they immediately believed. Okay, yeah, go ahead. How could they what? Right. Yeah. The text doesn't tell us that the women knew how his body had been prepared. Uh, but likewise, the angel meets him and says, uh, your, your mission's not necessary. So, yeah, I mean, in the gospel accounts, incidentally, skeptics, by the way, go through the gospel accounts and say, hey, pieces are missing. Uh, and you know, why would pieces be missing? We don't see the complete story here. That gives it credibility. I mean, you know uh, that there's collusion uh, when all the witnesses tell the identical story and the story is complete without holes. That happens in trials all the time. Uh, if the multiple t witnesses come forward with all the same story and it's a complete story, you know they colluded in advance. And so you know that you can't trust the testimony. You look for differences. You look for things that are left out. And if you can piece it all together into one credible story, you know the testimony is true. Uh, you know, I've done events for trial lawyers, and they tell me that's how we can figure out whether the testimony is true or not. And so if you look at the Bible, it reads just like the tests we have uh, for true testimony. And incidentally, that's brought out in this book by these three uh, British lawyers. They said, we examined the testimony of the four Gospels, the same way we evaluate testimony in a court of law. And so this meets all the criteria for being a true testimony. Okay, in the back, then I'll come back to you. Can you speak up so we can all hear? Yeah. Well, this is the problem uh, with Jews. We've had some Jews attend the class here over the years. And, you know, one of the big... No, 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 I'm talking about Jews for Jesus uses that as an argument in favor of Jesus. Yeah. That they can prove genealogy is listed. But now, let's say somebody came now and said they, they were the Messiah, you couldn't prove their genealogy. You couldn't prove their genealogy. Yeah. Yeah, and what's interesting, I mean, uh, I think what the Seder service, and uh, I know the way Dave does it, is that you have an empty chair for Elijah. Why? Because Jews believe that Elijah comes twice. And often what I've been sharing with Jews is, you believe Elijah comes twice, why can't God come twice? If Elijah can come twice, why can't God come twice? But that's the big difference. They say, we believe the Messiah comes once and fulfills all 300 plus prophecies in one coming. Well, why can't he fulfill one-third in one coming and two-thirds in the next coming? If Elijah can pull it off, why can't he pull it off? Yeah. And yeah, there was a Jew here in the class. That was a key uh, step for him giving his life to Christ.
But what he told me was, I couldn't convince any of my rabbis. But he was convinced. Yes. Then back to you. Yeah, go ahead. What you just told us about this resin material, where is that in the Bible? Where, what verse are you, where did you get that information? Well, it says a talent of rosin was uh, pressed into the linen cloth on his body. Where? I where think it's. It I think it's in the Gospel of John. It's in one of the Gospels. Yeah, but I was going to say, what you have to add to your answer to the question is Joseph Neal was a very wealthy man. Right. He made Jesus be very proper. Right. The other, the other is implied, obviously, that he was a very wealthy man. Yeah. He made this tomb for himself. He had the wealth to bury him properly. And, and so he would have been buried that way because Joseph Neal was wealthy. And, and yeah, he had a rich man's burial. But yeah, one of the Gospels, I'm pretty sure it's John. Someone look it up for me. Actually mentions that a talent's weight of rosin was pressed into his burial cloth. Wasn't, wasn't he taken to the tomb because they were so close to sundown on the Sabbath that they didn't have time to properly, that's why the women were coming on Sunday to dress him for burial because there wasn't enough time so how could they have done all that? Well, okay, that raises another issue because what the New Testament tells us is he was going to be dead for three days and three nights. And yet, when we celebrate Easter, we got Good Friday and Sunday morning. That's not 72 hours. And he said one hour of any day would be considered a whole day, right? Well, no, here's, here's how you resolve it. He was crucified during Passover week. During Passover week, you got between two and three different Sabbaths. So you can have a Sabbath on Thursday and a Sabbath on Saturday, and hence you can get the 72 hours. In fact, that's how scholars would try to determine the precise date of when he was crucified. Look on the calendar to see where you got a Sabbath on a Thursday and a Sabbath on a Saturday. The problem is you get several options, and yeah, it's not easy to uh, get accurate calendars uh, back that far. Uh, then I'll come back to you. Go ahead. One of, one of those attorneys that you were talking about was Simon Greenlee, I can't believe. But there, but there was a book um, I did a talk on several years ago called Faith on Trial by a woman lawyer named Pamela Ewan, E-W-A-N, and she did a modern day version of the same thing, basically looking at the evidence in the Bible for the death and resurrection of Jesus, and is it strong enough evidence to stand up in a court of law if it was ever needed? Right. She says it, it, it definitely was. So. Well, you are right that Simon Greenleaf uh, did write about this in the 19th century, and you're also right, many lawyers who weren't believers have put this to a, a, a courtroom test, and all of them come out saying the evidence for the bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead is uh, sound. One more piece I can share with you. Notice what the text says. Uh, the curtain was rent. Okay? From top to bottom, it was rent. Okay. That was the curtain dividing the holy place from the holy of holy place. And it has symbolic significance. That curtain basically tells you the way to God is blocked because of your sin. And that curtain was there to communicate to people your sin is a barrier. Until that sin is taken care of, you cannot enter into the Holy of Holies. In fact, when we celebrate communion, as it explains in the Gospel of John, the bread that we take symbolizes the fact that we now have access to God the Father. The curtain is rent. We can go straight to God the Father. Question for all of you. The wine that we drink, what does that symbolize? The blood, the blood of Jesus. Blood of and John 6 tells us what the blood of Jesus symbolizes. The new covenant. Okay. Okay. The bread means we can come right to the presence of the Father. What does the wine symbolize? The new covenant. Okay. You can read John 6. What it tells us is when you take that wine, it symbolizes the fact that not only can you come directly into the presence of the Father, and your sin no longer is a barrier to having a relationship with him, the blood symbolizes that he will give you power to live the Christian life. So that's what communion really means. The barrier has been broken, you can come to the presence of the Father, and the Father will give you the power uh, to live the Christian life. There's power in the blood, ever heard that song? Yeah. Well, basically it's a communion song. Uh, making that point. But here's something about the curtain, because I'm running out of time. The curtain that existed at the time of the uh, uh, time that Christ lived in the temple, the rebuilt temple, it was 
four inches thick, okay, and was about 20 feet tall. So you got this incredibly heavy curtain, 20 feet by 20 feet, four inches thick. And when Jesus died on the cross, uh, what happened? It tore from top to bottom. And suddenly there was no longer a barrier. And that was prophesied too, right? I don't think so. You know, my, my, a preacher friend of mine, a really famous preacher, um, he gets really ju- ju- Jewish people to fuddle, particularly the elders, when he asks, why is the temple gone? They have an answer for a lot of things, but they can't answer that. Why is her temple no more? And of course, we know it's, it's the Romans destroyed it, and it was prop- prophesied, right? Well, basically, yeah. if the curtain is rent, you don't need the temple. Exactly. Christ has already fulfilled but what the temple symbolizes. Gone. Right. But can you imagine the impact on the priests when you got this curtain four inches thick, you get an earthquake and it's rent from top to bottom and suddenly uh, it's clear, you got a clear view into the Holy of Holies. How do you think that impacted them? How do you think it impacted all the Jews living in the city of Jerusalem? I think this is one reason you get 15,000 converts within six months. But they were dispersed too, right? Well, they were, you know, Passover, you got Jews coming from all over the Roman Empire yeah. and beyond. But after the cross, they were dispersed. Right. So, but yeah, I mean, they could not only see the empty tomb, they could also hear the news of the curtain being rent. Say the Jewish leaders worked on their resumes at that point. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this side, yeah. yeah. Gonna, okay. Yeah, you've had your hand up. Sorry, but go ahead. Me? Yeah, go ahead, then I'll come back to you. Uh, you talk about all this evidence. People, I mean, Gary Habermas, 20 volumes of evidence. Basically, the, it's, it's kind of a question here, but okay. But, but uh, most of our really, the evidence is in the New Testament. Seems like, is everything else then just examining that and showing that this evidence is true? Or is there a new, actually new evidence? This being collected. Well, when the lawyers put this on trial, and some of them have, they said it's not just the New Testament. They said there is, so, you know, how do we de- how tell whether someone's innocent or guilty? There is no reasonable alternative to the conclusion we're drawing from the evidence. And so, kind of where the lawyers went, they said, look at the alternatives. The idea that uh, Jesus' uh, disciples stole the body has no historical credibility. That's gone. Okay. The Romans stealing the body, that has no credibility. If they had the body, they would produce it and put an end to the Christian faith. The Jewish leaders stole the body. Well, if they stole the body, being enemies of the Christian faith, they would have produced the body and said, hey, you're all wrong. So they're basically saying there is no reasonable historical alternative to the actual account we see in the New Testament. I mean, they say, think of a scenario. And uh, you'll see this done in Gary Habermas's work. He looks at about... 13 different scenarios. You know, things like, well, uh, maybe he didn't really die. Uh, Well, the Romans were pretty good at making sure the people they crucified actually died. And what do you see in the Gospel of John? One of the soldiers took a spear and put it through the body of Jesus in the torso. And what does the text say? Out of that wound came blood and water separated. Sure sign of death. Okay, in fact, a uh, guy on our board of directors, Alex Metherall, he's a medical doctor and, uh, an act- and a physicist as well. He's got a wonderful DVD you can see on our website where he says, a medical doctor looking at the crucifixion and basically makes the point, there is no doubt about the fact that he really did die. Um, Was it the water of the pericardial effusion? That that's it, saying? yeah, I mean, uh, if the fluid in your heart is separated in the blood and water, you're dead. Plasma. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, there's no way you, your body can function uh, at that point. And it was actually a test. That's how the Romans, because he died quite quickly on the cross. Let's make sure he's really dead. So they put a spear uh, through into his heart and out came this water and the blood uh, separated. And he says, yep, he's dead. So they took him down uh, from the cross. But, but the, 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 the positive evidence of the it's really the Bible. All these other things, they're just negative arguments. They're not, you know, I mean, they're, they're, uh, they're saying why it couldn't be true, but as far as actual positive evidence that this happened, 
That, is, that, that only comes from the Bible. Well, it's the Bible. It's the eyewitnesses. It's well, the number the of converts. Yeah. Okay. But notice uh, there's no refutations. Now you could say, well, maybe there are no historians around. There are plenty of historians around. And so, and particularly when you read Josephus and Tacitus, both of them uh, were much opposed to the Christian faith, and yet they basically back up what the New Testament said. So, uh, the lack of reputation, uh, okay. that that's very effective. Because, you know, this isn't a minor incident. Uh, like the one you said, I saw a unicorn. Well, one guy claims to see a unicorn. Okay, he must have too much to drink. Uh, but now you're looking at half of a city uh, becoming followers of Jesus Christ within a six-month span. This is not a minor incident. And therefore, the opponents of the Christian faith, if they had anything, they would have written something about it. Okay, I'm going to give you the last word. Go ahead. Oh, okay. um, travel from, um, true or not. Okay. I got 30 seconds to answer that because one. You, when you just said that was um, a form, the res, like a resin in the material form. Okay. Uh, you'll see stuff I've written about the Shroud of Turin okay. uh, in my book, uh, A Matter of Days. Also, some stuff I see on the web. Uh, I don't have enough time to give a complete answer to your question, but to tell you, you've got Christian scholars on both sides saying it has no credibility, it does have credibility. Uh, it could be resolved uh, with a better carbon 13, 14 date. Uh, they've not all given permission to perform uh, a better uh, test. So it's still, quote, in doubt. Uh, but the skeptics do have a point, is that uh, the carbon-14 date we have right now uh, indicates 13th century AD, and that was a time when there was a roaring business on artifacts of Christ. It's the same century that they sold 16 tons of wood from the cross of Jesus, <laughs> and uh, they were selling instruments that he drank from. So you know, that's why he needed help driving, driving, driving that cross. <laughs> yeah, real quick. Well, here's the point that the scholars have pointed out. The evidence for the bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead is so strong that the shroud is basically superfluous. I get that. I yeah. understand that. But it's still it's something that's in history that we're worried, that we're talking about. She brought it up. Yep. Others have. Is it as easy to demonstrate that it's a fraud as every other demonstrable fraud? It is. All you need to do is to get a really accurate carbon-14 date and different parts of the sample of here's the, the uh, shroud. Problem. Yeah. Well, I mean, what the people who are in favor of basically saying is we only gave them four square inches from the shroud and it's from the wrong part of the shroud. Well, the way to shut them up is say, you get to pick where you want to take it out of the shroud, get a big piece, get several pieces, we'll carbon date them all, and we'll see whether or not this is really credible. That would settle it once and for all, I would think, but that's not been done. But if what Dave is saying is true, maybe that wouldn't be the best way to go. No, but if you take eight different samples yeah. and take big pieces, that, that would eliminate some of the contamination. That would eliminate uh, some of the, and you know, they all come up 13th century, then you know, hey, this isn't real. So, okay, I got to pray and then I got to leave. Thank I you. Have, I have one brief announcement. Can you pray and leave? And I have to okay, good. <laughs> Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the day to celebrate uh, the resurrection of Jesus uh, from the dead. And Father, we know we're going to have many opportunities throughout this day and uh, Easter Monday uh, tomorrow. And uh, Father, I pray that uh, you would give each of us an opportunity to declare the evidence that yes, our Savior has risen bodily from the dead. And because he's risen bodily from the dead, we can be confident that we too will be raised bodily from the dead, given that we've uh, committed our lives to Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that this life isn't all there is. Uh, all of us are going to live beyond the grave. And Father, I pray that we would encourage our friends and relatives to choose the right place to spend the rest of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you.